Good afternoon. How are you? I'm well, thank yeah. you. I'm here today with um, Representative Ed Burns, who served in the 18th Legislative District from Bucks County. Hi. Um, he served from 1973 to 1991. How are you today? I'm fine. Great. Great. This is a, a great experience. Good. Um, I wanted to begin by asking you um, about your childhood and early life. How did that shape your, your views on politics? I don't even think I knew very much about politics in my early life. I was born and raised in Branchdale, Schuylkill County. Went to school there until I was about in the seventh or eighth grade. And then the, the war broke out, uh, and uh, my father was in, got a job uh, from the left the mines and came down to the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. He was a pipe fitter and got a job with the uh, government in the Navy Yard. And we all moved to Philadelphia. and. That was, I, I don't think anything shaped my mind about politics. The war, of course, that was a big thing. My uncle was a, a chaplain, went out with the Marine Corps in, uh, to Guadalcanal and so forth. But uh, the politics, I, I never knew another president beside Franklin Roosevelt at that time. Uh, so. Uh, well, was anyone in, in your family involved in politics? I th back in, uh, in uh, before my mother was married, and uh, my uncle, my great uncle Pat, her uncle, was on the school board in uh, Riley Township in uh, in uh, Schuylkill County in, in uh, Branchdale. But that, I, I, I didn't know much about that. I mean, I was just a kid growing up. But uh, he was on the school board there, and that was that was about the only person that I ever knew. Uh, from our family that was in politics. Did you always have political aspirations? No. No, not really. No. no. Okay. Well, how did you become involved in politics? And that's a, a strange story. The uh, Republican committee woman, Barbara Riley, who was now, uh, she's, uh, she was tax collector in Ben Salem at the time, and, and she's recorder of deeds now in uh, a register of wills in Bucks County. But uh, she came to my door, knocking uh, my door in Ben Salem Township after I was married, and we, my wife and I moved there. And uh, she uh, asked me if uh, I would vote for the Republican who was running for school board. And uh, everything I knew about this guy was he was the biggest bum in the ball the, the ballpark. And I said, why should I vote for him? You know, I mean, he's, a, he's apparently a bum in the ballpark from what everything I heard. And she, we got in a little bit of an argument. And she says, well, you're so smart. Why don't you run? And I said, well, you're so smart. Why don't you ask me? <laughs> and I, she asked me, and I ran. And the other guy got off the ticket. And that was, I was elected to the school board in Ben Salem Township, which was a surprise to me and everyone else. So why did you become a Republican? Uh, I guess uh, because she was... She was the one that came over and registered us, and uh, you know we became a. My wife, uh, I think at that time, was still a Democrat, she, and, and was one of those things in Philadelphia at that time. Uh, you were one and one, you know, in case you got a parking ticket. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, you could always go to some committee person, and uh, but uh, but my wife worked uh, for Michael Bradley. She was his secretary. He was. Uh, uh, a deputy managing director for the city of Philadelphia under Clark and Dilworth. And uh, then she went with uh, Mike Bradley, who had been a congressman. She went with him to the Board of Revision of Taxes. So she was a Democrat. I was a Republican. But then, of course, when I won, she changed. <laughs> well, could you describe your career and experiences before coming to the House, um, such as your education? Well, I, I graduated uh, from Northeast Catholic High School in Philadelphia. And I went on to LaSalle College in Philadelphia. I graduated from LaSalle and went into the service, uh, stayed in the service for uh, five years uh, between the reserve time and the active duty time. That was during the Korean War. And uh, got out of, the, out of the service and uh, went teaching in the city of Philadelphia. My mother had taught in the city of Philadelphia for many, many years. And she was like my mentor in the, to, to teach uh, in the city of Philadelphia. So uh, uh, in those days, uh, it was funny, my wife was making about 40, uh, for about, uh, well, I'm going to get this right, about $40,000 a year as a secretary with the city. She was one of them on a higher level of a secretary. 
And uh, I was making $2,800 a year as a teacher in the city of Philadelphia. So uh, the suburbs were just starting to m come along at that time, move along, and uh, I got a job in the Neshaminy School District. I think it was $100 more, so I quickly took it. <laughs> but uh, I, went, uh, I went with the Neshaminy School District, and I stayed there for uh, about 15 or 15 so years. I, I taught there. I left there to become uh, a state rep. What subject area did you teach? I taught social studies. I was certified in social studies and English, but I, I taught social studies. Most people say I couldn't speak English, so. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your military background? Yeah, I, uh, I joined the Navy uh, in uh, 1950, and uh, that was during the time of the Korean War, and I was sent uh, on board ship. I was on a PCE, which is a patrol craft, uh, a weather ship on the Great Lakes. and. Uh, then I got into, uh, I don't know how, but uh, because I, had, I was a history, a history major, they, they got me uh, tied up with air intelligence, and I was in air intelligence for the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. I briefed, you know, I was, a, I was a history teacher, so they figured I, I was a pretty good briefer and that type of thing. And uh, often during the, during the, uh, the uh, Korean War, I was, uh, I was teaching uh, in, I was called every summer to, when they knew I was out of school, they issued me orders to go down to Pensacola. So I was in Pensacola teaching uh, Naval History and World Affairs for about five years, uh, five different summers. Then they uh, start calling me on different times as the war increased in, uh, in uh, Vietnam. I was on a lot of uh, ASW work, uh, anti-submarine uh, work, uh, because the Russians at that time were running uh, the, the uh, submarines uh, between uh, the North Sea and uh, the Norwegian Sea and so forth down to Cuba. So we did all the patrol work be on, the, uh, on the Atlantic, a lot of the patrol work. And uh, I was briefing. I was, brief I was a briefer at Willow Grove. I was a briefer up at uh, Brunswick Naval Air Station. I was in Bermuda for about five years. Whenever they, I mean, five years I was back and forth. I was, in fact, one time I was still in the legislature and they called me and uh, I was down in Bermuda, and they, I, the planes that would leave Willow Grove to come down to Bermuda on ASW work, they would bring the mail down to me, and I'd call back, and my, you know, it, was, it got to be fun for a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, after the uh, Vietnam War, things settled down a bit, and I was a weekend warrior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, why did you run for the House of Representatives? Well, at that time, the, uh, I had just won the school board election. And there was, I, I was the only Republican. No, the, I'm sorry. There were two Republicans who won. One won for supervisor, Henry George, and, and I won on the school board out of all the candidates in the township. The township at that time was about uh, maybe 90% Democrat, 10% Republican. Henry had been a police officer, and he was known, and I was a teacher, and I was known. So uh, uh, I, I, won, I, I was sitting there fat, dumb, and happy as a school board member and a teacher, and uh, Otis Littleton came down to see me. I don't remember if you know, remember Otis. And Otis uh, said, look, we're going to start. You're one of the two guys that won. And the, the only reason they picked me for this seat, not the other guy, was they, they had the other guy figured out he was going to, Henry George, was going to be county commissioner. They, that was the big job, you know. Legislator was like a throwaway. So uh, he, he asked me if I would, I would run for the eight, new 18th legislative district. And I said, no, I, I didn't want to run. I, what am I going to At that time, I was making a lot of money as a teacher, $15,000 a year. I had a, I had a master's plus 60 credits above my master's, and I, they were going to pay me, I mean, they were paying me 15000 which was a lot of money in those days. And uh, the legislature was paying eight. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> no, I'm going to take a, basically a $7,000 cut to go with the legislature. And I said, no. And he kept after me, and they kept calling me, and Sam Hayes called me and told me he was... He was a, a teacher who had come to the legislature and so forth. And I talked it over seriously with my wife. And at that time, the legislature had passed a bill 
raising the pay from 8000 to 15000 Now I'm right on the level, you know. And uh, I think they had 8000 expenses, but they cut the expenses. It was, it was 8000 salary, and it used to be eight and eight, but then they cut it. I think they cut the expenses at that time, and it was eight and something. And I sat down with my wife, and she said to me, I'll never forget this, she said, they're only going to ask you one time. You're going to have one shot at this thing. And, uh, okay. And lo and behold, uh, luckily for me, McGovern was running as a, on the presidential ticket for the Democrats. And uh, Richard Nixon at that time was a very popular Republican. He was running on the Republican side, and uh, luckily I, I won. Slightly, but I, I won, you know. Well, did anyone help you get started with your first campaign? Not really. Uh, not really. There were no House members, you know, House staff that came down, and mm -hmm. there, was, there was no money from Harrisburg. There was nothing. I mean, okay. we, we did everything. Uh, I had some good people working for me, a fellow by the name of John Winward, uh, uh, Doris Jacobson. They were all people who lived in Ben Salem who I knew, and... Uh, John was an especially great guy because he was he was uh, with the uh, with Bell Telephone, and uh, he did he did one super thing one time. He was uh, on election right before election day. He had been on the train with Nixon and so forth as a Bell Telephone guy, communications type, you know. And he had these, this big badge uh, saying something about you know presidential and so forth and so on. It looked like a big shot, you know. And he had this badge, and he had his camera, and, and on election day, he said, we've got to be the first ones at the polls, and then we'll go from poll to poll. I said, okay. So we go up, and there's a big line waiting, and John's saying, get out of the way here. Here comes the candidate, and he's taking my picture, and people are saying, oh, who's that? Who's that? Oh, my God, he's with the president, and all, the, all of this, you know. And John played the role. And we went, we went around to all of the, all of the polls like that, and people are coming up saying, "Can I have my picture taken with you?" <laughs> it was great, and I won. <laughs> so. Uh, well, did you like campaigning? You know the way I campaigned, I hit every door in my legislative district, every campaign I ever ran, and it really paid off. I mean, people knew me. Uh, they may not have liked me, but they knew me. And I always wondered who those 5,000 people were who voted against me, you know. <laughs> I could never figure that out. But anyway, uh, that, that's the way I won, because I was in a district that was, uh, at that time, maybe about 10 percent Republican. And a lot of people at that time were moving up into the Corman development, uh, which is right, right up behind in the Chamonix Mall now. And uh, those people were all Philadelphia Democrats. A uh, little bit well-to-do, highly Jewish area it became, and a lot of lawyers and so forth and so on. But uh, they, uh, I got to know them because I knocked on their door. I'll never forget one fella. I locked, uh, knocked on his door, and he said he'd help me. He was an attorney. Lo and behold, uh, he, he uh, was, a, was a real good attorney. And he, he joined the Republican Party. I think he had been a Democrat in Philadelphia. I'm not sure. But he joined the Republican Party, and uh, I helped him very heavily become a uh, district attorney in Bucks County. I worked for him. I brought stuff home from Harrisburg for him. Uh, Alan Rubenstein. And Alan today is a judge in Bucks County and uh, one of my best friends. Did your family get involved in the campaigns? Yeah, my wife would always get involved. You know, my wife got involved. I, I had the three boys at that time at home. And, uh, you know, <laughs> when I was running for school board, I'll never forget one of my kids was, I think, in middle school at the time. And he came home and he said, Mom, you know what they said in school? I was, the lunch person told me, she said, Why is your father running with all those bums? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, you know, but the kids always got involved. And the dog got involved. We had his picture taken and used him, you know. So, did your campaigns change over time? Yes, uh, we, I, I guess, got more sophisticated. We didn't have John Winway running with his big button, but we got a little more sophisticated. But we had always had good fundraisers. 
John and uh, Doris and uh, Dot Ryan, who worked for me in the district office when, when we didn't have a district office, it was her kitchen, and uh, but uh, uh, they they always uh, they always worked hard and ran the good fundraisers. I remember one time we had uh, Mickey Shaughnessy. They got Mickey Shaughnessy. Uh, you might remember him from from Here to Eternity. He was he was in that movie from Here to Eternity. He was a, a comedian, and he was uh, very popular at the Wildwood at the shore. You know, he was a very popular guy who who did summer stints at the shore. And they had him in the firehouse one night <laughs> so, as a come on, you know, come on to uh, buy a ticket. But uh, they worked very hard. A lot of people, uh, Len, Len Brown, who, uh, in fact, Len Brown used to kick me in the butt to get me out campaigning on a Friday night. I'd say, Friday night, you know, everybody's out shopping. Yeah, because that's why we're going to the shopping centers, you know, so. But Len's a district justice now in, in Salem, and uh, but, uh, they all work very hard. Well, what were your first impressions whenever you came to Harrisburg? Well, you know, believe it or not, when I came to Harrisburg, and I forget whether there was a meeting between the newly elected legislators prior to the session or whether I got there the first day for session. I think there was a meeting before. First time I was ever in the Capitol. And uh, I, I was impressed. <laughs> I, I didn't, I'd never been there before, and uh, um, it, was, it was very impressive. Do you remember your first swearing-in ceremony and how you felt? Yes, uh, I, felt, I felt very, you know, it was like hitting a home run with the bases loaded. Uh, it, was, it was a great day and uh, uh, all the flowers and all of that. And, uh, and of course we had at that time, Dave Richardson was, was, was elected with me. I mean, he was in the same class. And he refused to get sworn in with the rest of us. He had of his own uh, private ceremony, and we could only we couldn't get seats on the house floor or anything. I, I remember my father was my father was about seventy five and could just about walk, and he had to go up in the he was up in the gallery, you know. And I remember my mother saying, "How do they give this guy a special thing? Look at the busloads of people coming in and sitting on the floor for him, and here we are <laughs> up in the, up in the gallery." But uh, 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 that was. <laughs> That's memorable, I guess. Mm -hmm. Did you have any mentors whenever you first started in Harrisburg? Oh yes, yes. I had a, I had a, a, a real great mentor, and that was Jim Wright. Jim Wright was from the district right next to mine, and uh, Jim took me under his wing, and uh, Jim and I became. I never knew him before, you know, before that, and uh, uh, we became fast friends. Mm -hmm. Who did you sit by on the house floor? Through your career, <laughs> well, you had many seats. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think. I was Jim, I know I was beside Jim one year, and uh, um, oh, uh, Mar 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 uh, Marv, Marv, uh, Marv, Marv, Marv was a no. legislator from Miller. No, no, Mar Marv was in our class too. But Mar this Marv, um, oh God, he was from Upper Bucks, and I can't, I can see him. I, in fact, I used to room with him once in a while. Marv, oh, no, I keep thinking of Wagner, and that's okay. not. But anyway, he, I sat beside him, and uh, you know, sat around a lot of interesting people, like Pat McGinnis, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> Ray. I mean, uh, Rick Sesser, and uh, a lot of good people. A lot of good people. Well, do you feel like you mentored anyone while you were there? Yeah, I helped uh, Roy Reinhardt when Roy uh, was going to run for the. Uh, House seat in in the the district that adjoined mine, uh, he came and asked me what's what, and I, I tried to help him as, as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And I always, as a kid, I said I helped a lot of Democrats out to vote on mm -hmm. on PSEA bills. Mm -hmm. Could you change comment on the changes in party leadership throughout the years? Yeah, uh, of course. But we had uh, we had uh, Jack Seltzer. Jack was a very aloof type of guy. I mean, he wasn't a warm, fuzzy guy as, uh, um, oh, um, oh uh, uh, Bob Butera was. And of course, uh, the best of all was Matt Ryan. I mean, Matt was a, Matt was a super, super ace. Between he and uh, Bob Butera, I mean, they were, the, they were the two best leaders I thought the Republicans ever had and while I was there. Um, 
with, but we had we had Seltzer. Who else did we have as a leader? Uh, of course, Sam Hayes. Sam was uh, Sam was a hard, hard working guy, and uh, helped me quite a bit. You know, gave me a lot of good advice. I remember one time there was some issue that the press was all over, and uh, Sam came to me and he said, "When they come to you, go deeper than a walleye pike." <laughs> So I did. Never said a word to them, and I, I think that was part of their problem with the pay raise. They all kept talking to the press. Had they all gone deeper than a than a, a walleye pike, the press would have not, had nothing to write. You know? So I blame them themselves for those, that fiasco. Mm -hmm. How did you work with both Democratic and Republican leadership to resolve legislative issues? Oh, I I always got along very well. Uh, uh, Leroy Irvis, uh, he was a very, very civil guy. Uh, um, the president, uh, oh, uh, what's his name, the president, uh, Bill DeWeese. Bill DeWeese and I were always friendly. Uh, every, everybody on the Democratic side, I had a good relationship with everybody on the Democratic side. I, I worked very closely with Jim Gallagher, who was uh, who was the head of the education committee. He was from Bucks County, and Jim and I had an excellent relationship. In fact, they used to call us uh, um, Gallagher and Sheen, an old radio program in the 30s that uh, they said, here comes Gallagher and Sheen again. You know, they were... But uh, Gallagher and I had a great relationship. Uh, I had a great relationship with uh, with the uh, all the Democrats from Bucks County. I mean, we were like... There was no... There was no Bitterness. There was no, well, you know, you go out and have a beer with them. I mean, there was no, uh, no secrets. No, no you know, it was it was a great time. I understand it's not quite like that now. So, <laughs> what legislation or issues did you feel were your most important? Well, the ones I liked the bingo bill. I always liked that, and uh, uh, that was uh, my. I I always said with uh, two guys that that uh, wrote that bill. One was Rabbi Isaacson from Philadelphia, and the other was Monsignor Musio, who was my pastor. So uh, I think between uh, all the information I got from them and the help that I got from them, uh, I was able to uh, to get a bill. Mm -hmm. And that was in '81. Was 82. it? Uh, was that when it was? Okay. When you know, I'd, well, you you mentioned dates and places, and uh, I'm like a General Motors commercial. You know, as I get older, General Motors recalls more and I recall less <laughs> so do, do you remember the specific issues regarding that bill uh, yeah it was how much could be uh, awarded it per night uh, and who could do it uh, the the real thing came with uh, the problem with that was uh, the district attorney I think in Philadelphia and Bucks County but the district attorney came in Bucks County to, to me the the Jewish war veterans at that time were renting, you know, vacant places in shopping centers. And the Post may have had five members, and they were taking in fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year running these bingo games, and the money was going for trips to Hawaii for the members, you know. <laughs> and the district attorney, uh, Ken Beam, in uh, Bucks County came to me, and we talked about it, and went over a lot of things, and it became a very difficult bill to pass because a lot of the firehouses ran bingos, and they had all all the legislators who represented all those firehouses, they had ideas, you know, and uh, it became a very difficult, how many days could you play, how many, how much money could you win, how many, how much a night, and you know, how much could you build up, and all of that, all of that became an issue, and I'll tell you, I think it was Marv Miller was was a was a leader, uh, you know, sort of against me in that. I mean, he he represented a lot of the conservative areas that really didn't want bingo. And of course, I was from Philadelphia. You could outside of Philadelphia, in Philadelphia suburbs, he, no problem at all. You know. So, did you have any problems with um, dealing with the who may work the games at the different? Locations? Yeah, we did, and. Uh, we uh, got to, I know the, the Pennsylvania Crime Commission came and talked to me about the whole thing, and we tried to put all of that from the DA, from the Crime Commission, from the pastors. We tried to get everything as, as best we could to come to a compromise, and we did finally. And even after, afterwards, I guess it was about five or six years after 
or maybe more than that, the Philadelphia or the Pennsylvania Crime Commission guys got to me and they said, you know, it's not working. You know, they were they were having problems with it. And I I believe I was out of I know I was out of legislature then because I didn't get involved in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you were also known for sponsoring legislation that has named our state's official fossil. <laughs> How did that come? Ficus Rama. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, a fellow by the name of Tony, and I forget his last name, he was a teacher in the Ben Salem schools, Tony something. And uh, uh, he came to me and said that the kids have, a, they want to bring up a bill on Harrisburg and so forth and so on. And I got together with the kids and, and uh, they showed me their, their work and I went to the legislative bureau and came back and showed them all our work. And uh, we, fought like hell to get it on the calendar. And you know, it was, that was the bill. Of all the, all the things I voted on in Harrisburg over the years, that was the bill that only got, that got me more press. Out in Pittsburgh, they, were, they had it in the, in the newspapers, and it got me more. I could have run for governor at that point. You know? I was getting so much press over a fifth, fourth grade or second grade or whatever it was, third grade group of kids who had written this bill uh, from from Ben Salem schools, and uh, uh, we got it passed finally. We got it passed. Okay, I have to ask: Was there controversy over this? Yeah, there was. The, you know, they didn't want to bother with nobody. You know, this is crazy. What what is this bill coming up here? You know, but I had I had some friends on the other side, Bud George. Uh, I think he was. I think it was in his committee, if I'm not mistaken. But but uh, I, through through my friendship with the other side of the aisle, I got the bill. On the uh, on the agenda and uh, it passed. Mm -hmm. um, you worked with the public school code. Yes. And there were a lot of issues there. Oh God, we had uh, we were trying to redo the code at that time. Uh, I guess under the direction of the Secretary of Education, the governor. I think the governor was a Democrat at that time. I think it was Casey. I'm not sure. What year was? It? Do you have the year there? I had seventy nine eighty. And who would that have been? Uh, might have been even Thorn. Might have been Thornburg. I'm, uh, yeah. But anyway, there was a, a move to redo the public school code, and Jim Gallagher and I got involved with it. And uh, Sam Hayes was the whip at that time, I believe, or he may have been the may have been the majority leader. Uh, the uh, well, we weren't in the majority. He may have been the minority leader at that time. And uh, Gallagher and I worked very, very hard on that code. And I forget all the specifics about it now. But uh, we took turns on the floor, uh, and that's when we got the name Gallagher and Sheen, because <laughs> I'd, I'd speak and he'd speak. And so uh, we, I, I think we did do some work on it. I mean, we got some things passed, some things changed. I forget all the specifics, to be honest with yeah, you. But so, some of the topics were furlough of teachers and uh, residency requirement for teachers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We that that was a big one. We we had a fight. Uh, we had to fight a lot of the uh, local, um, oh, local government types there because, you know, the police at that time were required to live in the townships and. And the workers were retired, required to live in the townships, but the, 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 the uh, teachers weren't. And uh, we, we kept that in that they weren't. And, then, and finally, the police were able to move out. And, you know, they all profited, I think, from our, our work on that uh, particular issue. But uh, <coughs> we, uh, we did a lot of work on that issue. Mm -hmm. In 1977, you fought for and passed Bill um, House Bill 677, which prohibited employers from firing or penalizing employees who missed time. For to, fighting a fire. Um, yep, for volunteering as fire. Yep, yep, yep. What can you tell us about that? Well, I knew just speaking to different volunteer fire companies uh, throughout my district, <coughs> and I also knew uh, from the uh, fire companies that I'd heard from from other districts, that it wasn't like the old days. Uh, in the old days, the town, the fire company was developed in the town, and the town workers, the, the, the workers all lived in very close proximity to the town. Uh, they either worked in the town or they lived, uh, they worked right outside the town. And when the alarm went off, everybody could hear it, and these guys came, whether it be 10 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon or midnight or whenever, they, they came to, uh, to fight the fire. 
but things have changed, and, and there, there's problems today. Uh, for example, right here in uh, Pocono Pines, they have a volunteer fire company. You know, I'm not, I don't know that much about it. I mean, I can just surmise, but there are not many people who work in Pocono Pines. I mean, there's maybe a few in a candy store or a gas station, but there, there's nobody that really works uh, around so that when that whistle goes off, there's nobody to fight a fire. So <coughs> uh, that, that is a problem, and I guess will remain a problem. But the problem that, that we were fighting at that time on that bill was, let's say the, the whistle went off at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, and there were people here, and they could get to the fire company. But they were fighting the fire at 10 o'clock in the morning when they were supposed to be at work at 8 so uh, <coughs> we, uh, we got that bill so that uh, they wouldn't be fired if, if the, I think the fire chief had to give them, uh, you know, had to say, hey, this is a fire. He had to document it and so forth. And uh, we were successful with that bill. And I, I think the volunteer fire companies still have a real problem today. Um, another piece of legislation was uh, your involvement with libraries. Yeah, yeah. I, of course, I always... You know, having been a teacher and worked in the educational community, uh, I always listened to what they had to say and tried to get them the money to to run the library systems throughout the state and so forth. And they've done they they have a great. I mean, it's it's unbelievable <coughs> that uh, the different uh, areas like this, uh, Pocono Pines, has one of the best libraries. I've we didn't have that good a library in Philadelphia when I was a kid. You know. When, he just went around, but but and Philadelphia always had a good library system. I mean, I'm not I'm not knocking it, but I'll tell you, it, it, it'd be hard to beat this library that we have here, and it's all because we fought to put money into the library system mm -hmm. throughout the state. Could you talk about your involvement with the uh, Lemon Laws? Oh yeah, yeah. Phyllis and I. Phyllis was my staff person on that, and and uh, we worked very hard on that. And Charlie Lachlan was was the committee chairman <clears throat> that was in the uh, the Consumer Affairs Committee and uh, Charlie and uh, Woody and Woody is a staff member on the oh, Democrat side that Woody Kosloff I think he's still there is he? He passed he, away. Oh Woody passed? I didn't know that. Oh, I, I know his sister is, uh, is president of Bloomsburg College but I didn't I didn't know Woody passed away. Well I'm sorry to hear that but he worked very hard on that and uh, we, we got it uh, we got it passed, and uh, the governor signed it. And I uh, remember the uh, the day the governor signed it, Phyllis slipped me a big lemon, <laughs> and we put it on the table in front of the governor. You know, so. Uh, Would you uh, mind just talking a little bit about the issues? Well, the issues were the person who bought a car that was a lemon, mm -hmm. and they couldn't do anything about it. I mean, they. <clears throat> kept taking it back to the garage and and the uh, company would say no it's not our fault it didn't happen here you've got to take care of that and they never took any responsibility for <laughs> for the uh, for the fact that the car was quote a lemon but uh, th this bill uh, you know talked to that we and we we spoke to a lot of people uh, on the committee when we, we held committee hearings and, and even just Charlie and I uh, meeting to talk to different um, uh, different dealers and, and different uh, people from the industry and people who were from the, uh, from the um, uh, attorney general's offices and so forth and uh, finally we got, uh, got it passed and we got a bill that uh, enabled people who really had a lemon to, to get compensated for it, to be able to take it back and get a new car, get their money back or whatever. Did you have any opposition? Uh, yeah, you know, there's always a lobbyist around that were pushing people for uh, the, the new car dealers and the used car dealers and, you know, the, the manufacturers. And, uh, yeah, we did have some opposition. Yeah. What is key in your mind to getting legislation passed? Having a good relationship with all the members. And that's what I always tried to do. I, in fact, I, I, I was up in the house maybe a year ago, and I was really amazed. I, I walked in the back of the house, and everybody clapped. And, they, and uh, in fact, I went in to get a haircut, and uh, Dweez came in, and God, he was like my long-lost uncle. And uh, 
We had a, I, I was really impressed. Guys came out of their seats, and the, not only Republicans, I mean, Democrats came out to, to talk to me, Tom Tagg, and, uh, and who I always was friendly with. And uh, in fact, one of my, the, the things I hated about this last election, the primary, was uh, my good friend, uh, Democrat, who came into the House as a Republican, and you think I can think of his name now, <laughs> uh, from Scranton, uh, got beat in the primary. Uh, Bellardi, Fred Bellardi, and uh, Fred came into the House as a Republican on a on an election that uh, I guess I uh, I forget what there was some issues, but uh, that's how he got in because Dem a Republican finds it pretty hard to win in Scranton, and uh, he came in and he, he he changed over and he told me he said I changed over he said I I just couldn't win as a Republican in Scranton no matter how good I was. And he was a good legislator for a lot of years, and he got beat because of the pay raise, which I, I didn't think was fair, but that's, you know, I'm prejudiced. Is it frustrating at times when a bill of yours doesn't get the deserved attention? Yeah, it is. It really is. Uh, if you can't, you, you know, you have something you really want, you're trying to press for it, and you're trying to tell, you tell people that you're going to get it, you know, that's, oh, I'm going to have that fixed. Well, and you can't do a thing about it, and you gotta go back and say, "Geez, I I didn't get it fixed. I couldn't." But I I always had pretty good uh, pretty good uh, luck. Uh, probably a lot of things I didn't get passed, but I I always had a good rapport with the other side, and uh, I could go and talk to people about it, and they may say, "Hey, Ed, no way, we can't do this," and these are the reasons why. But it was never rancor. It was never any bitterness. It was always. You know, let's go out and have a beer, and I'll tell you why we can't do it. You know? Could you describe some of your important issues that were aspects of your committee work throughout your career? That were what? Um, some of the issues that you deal, dealt with in, in the committees in which you served. Well, uh, the consumer affairs, we one of the big issues, and, and I see in some of the newspapers it's uh, still an issue, is the rent, this rent furniture, for rent things for your home. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, those people really rip you off. You, and and Charlie and I and uh, and uh, uh, Woody Kozlov uh, worked worked very hard to do something there, and we never got anything really done. Um, we couldn't get the support for it. There was too much pressure against us and so forth. But people get ripped off like crazy on that rent, you know, the, that rent to own and all of that nonsense. That was one big one. Uh, some of the PUC issues we got the. Uh, one of the things we did do was get the uh, the PUC uh, commissioners uh, from uh, ten years to six years. I think their terms. We got that passed when, from the uh, from the uh, uh, the uh, Consumer Affairs Committee. Uh, another one that, that, that I really worked hard to get passed, and that was uh, to get the supervi the, the school board terms down from from uh, six years to four years. So that was part of the school code change. That was another big one we got. Um, those are the those are the top ones. They had the Lemon Law and the, and the Kids Bill and you know so. But as I said, I, I forget a lot of them. But there, there probably was a lot. Do you recall how the House dealt with major events that affected the way Pennsylvanians lived, such as Three Mile Island? And you know, it was funny. I was I was there. At, I was. That night before, the night that it happened, I was in that restaurant and right across the street, basically, what's it called? The, 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 what was the restaurant? It was Jim Wright and I went over there to have dinner. And uh, we were sitting in that place, ate dinner, left, came back, went to bed, got up in the morning, went down to the, to the house. And at that time, I think I had a, an office on the third floor of the house facing back into the old back parking lot. And you heard the, we found out what was happening, and you heard the alarms go off, the uh, city air raid warden sirens were going off, and people were really scared. A lot of the secretaries were crying, and they were dismissing the house and so forth, and uh, I stood looking out the windows, you know? and. To me, when an air raid siren went off, it brought back to World War II and, and Korean War and so forth, you heard these air raid sirens go off, and we, I was never in a place that was bombed at that time, but, but you always thought about, oh, here come the planes, and they're going to drop bombs, and you've got to do this and that. 
And I stood there looking out over the back parking lot out to the that park back there, and I thought, where are the planes, you know? Well, you know, that's what it, it just took you into that mode or that era. And uh, they dismissed the house, of course, and people were running out of the house and crying and so forth and so on. Everybody was going to die. And I remember down at the governor's office, I went down by the governor's office, and all the, the, uh, the, the Good Morning Today shows were all there, and they were all interviewing the governor, and, and anybody that would talk, they would talk to. And, and uh, Jim Wright and I were on the Ant Mines and Energy Management Committee at that time. But we left because it was, just, I mean, we didn't know anything at that time. And we drove down, and I drove down uh, the, the road that, what is it, 83 that goes out to the turnpike, out by the airports that way, and you keep going out to the turnpike. And I thought, and go, I thought, hey, this damn thing is right here, you know? And they were talking about cows dying and the milk's bad. And I mean, it, it was just, and I thought, what am I doing here? Let's get out of here, you know? But then, uh, then the Mines and Energy Management Committee got involved in it, and Jim, I never had the opportunity. Jim got the opportunity to go through, walking through there after things settled down a bit and so forth and so on. But it was a, it was a, it was a different time in Harrisburg at that point. And to think I, when it's, when it's all happening, I'm eating across the street. <laughs> so, could you comment on the changes in the house structure while you were a member? Well, there was a, there were a lot of changes. I mean, there were a lot of when when I came to the house, I I was in an office I think with eight legislators and two phones, and you took turns using the phone. You never had a phone on the house floor, uh, so you you just took turns doing those kinds of things. Stu Greenleaf was was sitting right behind me in a desk. Cause Stu was still in, he's a senator now, but he's still in the Senate. And uh, Charlie Volpe, who died, he was in there. And we had one, you know, we didn't, I forget what our expenses were. But they were almost nothing, you know, compared to what you had to spend. And the lunchroom was right down the hall from us. And we were backed up the wall back to the back parking lot, the old back parking lot. And we had this fella, and I can't think of his name now, but he was, he was a retired lieutenant commander from the Seabees. He was from a legislator from Montgomery County. And he brought a, a mobile home type of thing up and put it in the parking lot. Now he had to get electricity. So he was running lines from our office. They had these little windows like you could sort of about that big to let air in or something. And he was running lines out through there to his trailer <laughs> to get electricity in the trailer. Oh, God, they were, they were funny days. But um, as... I, oh, pardon me, I'm going to have to... Uh, leave it right. Leave it ring. Leave it ring. Okay. Leave it ring. Uh, you know, leave a leave a message. They want me to get me on the cell phone. But anyway, um, that's why I know it's my wife. She was at the doctor's, and I got to meet her. But anyway, uh, they have all kinds of things now. They have, uh, you know, they have uh, offices that I had one of the best offices when I left. I was in the new. The, the absolute new part, you know, looking out over the fountains and so on. And uh, they have district offices. We never had district offices. We never, nobody had money for, I mean, my, the leadership wouldn't give you a nickel for uh, to get a beer, you know, they wouldn't. But, uh, but now they have the home offices. They have home expense accounts and they have this staff. and that. Pardon? Staff. Staff, yeah, staff. Uh, I mean, I had Connie, you know. And when I was committee, uh, either the ranking Republican or the chairman of the committee. I did get one person, uh, Greg, uh, Greg uh, he, he went with the education department. Uh, but anyway, I had Greg and, uh, you know, you got one person who was the, for the committee. He was, wasn't your staff, he was your staff guy in the fact that you were the chairman or the ranking uh, person, but, but he was really the committee's. And uh, they have, uh, like you say, staff and phones and. Now, toward the end, we did get some of those things. We got uh, the car allowance. We got the, um, the uh, oh, the uh, it, per diems were increased. Uh, I guess uh, we got, well, if we had phones, we had phone in our home office. And that was, I used to let people come in. They, somebody would say, gee, I, I have to make a phone call to my cousin, and I really can't afford that. Boy, it's tough. Let's come on down to my house. Make it on the state phone, you know. I thought they're paying for it. 
let them use it. But I had a lot of people come in and use the state phone on, but they didn't do it to, to call Aunt Sally. That's my wife. I've got to get this. Go ahead. Did you have a district office that coincided with your office in Harrisburg? I had a district office in my home, which we never, I was never paid for or anything. It was, I made an office in my home in Ben Salem, and uh, you know I had my phones in there. I could call Harrisburg at all times, and uh, Dot, who who worked for me, they, by that time we were we were given a home secretary, and uh, Dot worked between her kitchen and my office. She had we had a call forwarding type of thing, and when uh, when I wasn't in the office and she wasn't at that office, she was in her kitchen, <laughs> and she'd pick up the phone and take all the messages. How would you compare the technology in the house today with that during your first years in office? I was amazed when I went uh, when I went up there and saw those computers on the. I, I said, it's a good thing I'm not here. I don't know how to use them. But uh, uh, the technology has just been fantastic. They have all phones on. Well, we had phones on our desk after a while, in the, in the, I guess in the 80s. Uh, but uh, uh, between the phones and the computers, and uh, uh, I really don't know what else they have now, but, uh, you know, on the, the technology side. But uh, I guess they got everything that is anything. So. <laughs> Well, do you think that that changed the way that laws are? Oh, yeah. I think it's, uh, it's a different, different uh, an animal in Harrisburg today from what I've seen and from what I've heard from other people. Uh, there's no more of the camaraderie uh, that there was in our day. Uh, our day, it was, uh, you know, person to person type of thing. Now, uh, I don't know if these guys, half of these guys talk to one another. You know, they're, it's a different, different ball game. Could you explain your relationship with the media? I always had a, a fairly good relationship with the media, except when I became mayor of Ben Salem and I was still a legislator, uh, and I had promised to, you know, if I won the mayor's, mayorship, I would, I would resign. But Matt was the speaker at that time, and he wouldn't call a special election, so it would have meant that the the, the house, the seat, the house district would not have been represented. So I stayed on and I was I was running back and forth to Harrisburg all the time. Like I'd be up there f till three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever and session ended and I'd be home and I'd work at the township building ten, eleven o'clock at night. So <clears throat> because we were just changing the form of government and everything else at that time. And the press took me on for that. Uh, but other than that I had a good relationship with the press. What role do you think the lobbyists play? They they play a very important role. Uh, they at least the ones I've ever dealt with. They come in, they explain what the bill was all about. They explain why it was good, why it was bad, why they liked it, why they didn't like it, why you should like it, why you shouldn't like it, uh, how it affected your district, and and so on and on. I always had a good relationship with them. I if if they took me out and bought me a meal. I took them out and bought them one. I bought. I had uh, uh, Stony Starner, who was a magnificent lobbyist. I always thought for for uh, uh, Beltel. Uh, he and I'd go out to dinner. He'd pick up the check. I brought him up here. He and his wife came up here. We went out and played golf. I paid for the golf. I paid for the dinner up here. You know, he was my guest. He stayed here at the house. So I had a very good relationship with with lobbyists and anything. Usually that that they did, I tried to reciprocate in kind. The same, you know, and and I uh, these people who think you're going to, the lobbyist is going to uh, change your mind because he you bought uh, he bought you a, a steak dinner or something. It's crazy. I mean that's that's ridiculous. But you can't tell people that, you know. Uh, so I get so mad that very few people know how government works. Very few people could care less how government works until something gets them riled up. Uh, they have no idea what the, the time a legislator spends, uh, the hours that a legislator works. I get mad at some legislators. I mean, there were some legislators that I never really cared for in that they never had a job in their life till they came to Harrisburg and then they were living uh, basically high on the hog because they had nothing before they came there, you know. So that. Uh, uh, 
the, uh, the the people don't know that the, the what goes on, how you work, how you didn't work. When you're a freshman, you go up there and, and you don't work very much because you don't know anything. You're not on very many committees or you're not important at all. You have to work your way into the system. But as you're there a few years, I'll tell you, it becomes you're there instead of three days a week, you're there five days a week. And, uh, and when you're not there, you're at a firehouse or you're at a township building or you're at a senior citizen center or all the time. It never ends. I mean, and, you know, you're just answering phone calls all the time and running here and there all the time. And uh, I, I know I, I talked to Denny O'Brien from Philadelphia quite a bit. And uh, I know I try to get Denny on the phone and I'll get him. <laughs> on his cell phone finally and he's down the center city he's going to see the DA about some bill he's going over to see the board of revision of taxes about somebody's assessment or something he's always running I mean it's it's non-stop and when you when you come home and you're ready to put your feet up uh, it's the firehouse dinner you know <laughs> well I, I, I used to hope for Saturday night when I could go home and my wife would say we're going to have what would you like I say I'll tell you what I'd like I'd like a cheeseburger, a nice cheeseburger. I've been eating out in restaurants all week. I, I'm tired of eating out in restaurants, you know. And we'd sit down and she'd make cheeseburgers for Saturday night dinner, you know. And uh, but and then Sunday afternoon you're off again back to Harrisburg. So it's uh, it's a tough life, and people don't realize that at all. But these, I think, some of these uh, these guys. Uh, who the populist movement guys will, if they get elected, they'll find, they'll change their tunes. What aspect of your job as representative did you enjoy the most? Oh, I guess just the camaraderie of with uh, the people in Harrisburg. They, I had uh, I had a great relationship with people there. They were wonderful, and that's what I missed the most when I left. No, so that was that was what I liked. You, you talked about uh, Representative Wright. Anyone else? Oh, I yeah, uh, Rick Sesser. I still still call Rick, and he calls me. Uh, Bob uh, Bob Scheip, who was the chief clerk, I call him in Par in uh, Florida. Uh, I, I met him. Uh, I guess it was two years ago. I was up at the cemeteries on near Memorial Day on uh, in Pottsville, and uh, I went out to the club with him and had had lunch. He and his wife. Uh, just uh, I you know Tom Tag. I see on election day here. In fact, I gotta I gotta send a note to uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, no, uh, he, he resigned. He's he's leaving this time uh, from Scranton. Big heavy set Democrat. Uh, oh, not Bellardi. Uh, he was a minor league pitcher. Funny guy. Gaynor Funny Cawley. Guy. Gaynor Cawley. He's he was supposed. I had a bad shoulder, and Gaynor was supposed to get me some liniment. That was horse liniment, you know, for my shoulder. Well, I'll take care of it. I'd see him on election day at the polls. I'm going to take care of you. So now he's retiring, and I'm going to write him a little note. You know, you're not leaving till you send me the horse remedy for my shoulder. <laughs> but uh, those are the kind of relationships you had that, that you'll never forget. What aspect did you like the least? I guess the the fact that you could never put your feet up when you were home. You always had to. You had a senior citizen lunch, and you had to meet with uh, the county commissioners. You had to run to a firehouse, uh, you know, that type of thing. Bingos, you know, we, wherever wherever they wanted you, you had to be. Um, you did not give a farewell address that we could find in the record. No, I don't think so. Was there anything uh, you'd like to say uh, now? Tears came to my eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well... I, I really appreciated all of the time I spent in Harrisburg. I tried to do the best. I tried to uh, be a person who could look in the in the mirror in the morning and and say, "Hey, I did the best I could." I didn't, you know, I, I did I did what what best I could for for everybody that I knew, and uh, I just thank the people who elected me those many years, and. Uh, I thank my family, of course, who had to live through that time. And that some of those times were tough because of uh, the schedules and everything else. And uh, I, I, I just uh, like to thank the good Lord that he, uh, he uh, let me have a good career. What was your fondest memory of serving in the House? 
Oh, there were so many of them. I don't. Uh, I really don't know which was. Just every day there was a was a was a fond memory as I look back on it, and uh, I don't I don't know if I have any one fond one. Uh, a lot of funny ones. Uh, remember Bill uh, Bill Rebeck, uh, He was from Bethlehem. He he had one arm and one leg, and uh, believe it or not, he kicked field goals for. Moravian or Lehigh University when he was with his one leg. He, you know, he had the arm and leg cut off when he was a child on the railroad, he used to tell me. And uh, I didn't, uh, you know, first time I ever saw him, he was, he was elected, and I was sitting in the front row of the swearing in day. And, you know, I saw him come in with one crutch, and I said, Why do you have one crutch? He says, Because I only have one damn leg. You know, <laughs> he had one arm in the pocket, you know, there was no arm there. And, and he had the one crutch, and he had one leg off and, and one arm off. And, uh, and, and that, I was never so embarrassed in my life. But, but a lot of, lot of funny things that happened. And, and uh, just, just, you know, going up there and see Buster, who, who was the men's room attendant. I mean, you know, those kind of, and, and the fellow, I understand now, he's got, uh, he had uh, prostate cancer or something there. That was the barber. He was. Oh, they were great guys. I mean, everybody was. Everybody was fun people in those days. So, what have you been up to since you left the house? Oh, not much. I uh, unfortunately uh, got uh, skin cancer. I have a melanoma, and I've been. Uh, I have to be out of the sun all the time. So, but I play golf. I got special shirts that the sun won't go through and so forth. But I play golf and. Uh, between the golf and the hospital, I'm, I'm fine, mm -hmm. you know. But no, I I shouldn't. I, I am fine. I mean, I I enjoy every day watching TV. My wife said watch too much of it, I read a little, and play a little golf. And the winter is tough up here. I don't I don't do much. We usually went to Florida, but we couldn't go this year because I was operated on. But uh, you know, it's doing nothing really. Are you still active in politics? No. No, no. I talk to guys once in a while around here who know a little about politics, but uh, you know, they, these these type of communities you either grew up in, or you're you're an outsider. You know, and I'm I'm an outsider. <laughs> Do you have any advice for new members? Yes, the biggest advice is go deeper than a wall-eyed pike when these controversial issues come up and you have to speak to the press because you're going to make it get wrong. You're going to get the you're going to you're, you're going to be not misquoted, but you're going to make mistakes on what you say. And uh, especially these guys who say I'll never raise taxes. Well, keep your mouth shut and just do your job and do the best you can and don't 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 make any predictions. <laughs> okay, lastly, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, just as a, a guy who did his best for a number of years, that's all, and who loved everybody and hoped he was loved back. Okay. What do they say? What is it? Philadelphia loves you and you love Philadelphia back or something? Like that. that's, that's about it, even though I'm long gone from Philadelphia. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Our interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.